This is a modified version of the technology year in review that I presented at the HPA Tech Retreat on February 17th of this year in Indian Wells, California. And actually it turned into a sort of largely retro technology year in review. Now, I might be somewhat biased because A, I'm old and B, I'm in New York City, which is the capital of old media. And uh, I live in a building where many of the residents, including me, still get daily newspapers delivered. But let's look at the transition that people are talking about uh, going to ultra high definition. And I have a question. Have we finished the transition to high definition yet? And uh, at the technology uh, retreat, the HPA Tech Retreat, I showed a cartoon of uh, an image of a doctor talking to a patient who's too wide. And it appeared in The New Yorker on September 15th. And the doctor says to the patient, I'd like to see what we can do about fixing your aspect ratio. So this is something that I'm not the only one who's been noticing, that there are still some uh, hiccups in just the transition to HD. Now, here was some breaking news at the uh, tech retreat. Uh, Samsung and LG abandoning 3D TV, to which my big comment is, whew! Um, some more breaking news. Uh, this person said that, has TV become the second screen uh, relative to the Super Bowl? Well, in a word, I would say no. And why would I say that? Because this seems to support what he was saying. Super Bowl 50 set a new streaming record, according to CBS. It was up 75% over 2015. That's extraordinary. So it was up all the way to about 1.25% of the broadcast TV audience, uh, which was much, much bigger than the streaming audience. And the people who streamed it spent much less, less time viewing it. Um, here's a, another news report uh, shortly before that from Nielsen saying that live TV still dominates viewing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's one from Advanced Television saying that TV even dominates millennials' media lives, and I'll show you some uh, more data about that in a moment. So here is a survey that was done by Deloitte, their digital democracy survey, and notice the orange arrow at the left, and it's down by the seniors, uh, 68 years old and more, and 90% of their time um, using some sort of devices is, spelt, is spent watching TV, and 9% on computers, and only 1% on smartphones. Um, so that's certainly a strong batch for TV, but that's people 68 plus. What do we really care about them? Well, here's a story that appeared in the New York Times saying that centenarians are proliferating and living longer. But let's go back to that Deloitte chart, and this time the orange arrow is coming down from the top and it's way over at the right and it's showing smartphone usage. Now, a lot of people are saying that mobile is uh, king, but even in trailing millennials, these are the people who are 14 to 25 years old, the bulk of their usage, it's not a majority, but it's the certainly the largest amount, is spent watching TV, as that headline suggested. And then the next largest amount is uh, people who are using their computers, and then tablets and smartphones, each about 8%. Now here's uh, another headline. This one is later, so this actually didn't appear in the version that was done at the tech retreat. And it says that NBC has hit a record in Olympic ad sales. That's broadcast commercials. Um, 1.2 billion, and that's without even selling all of their commercial slots yet. Um, 2015 also turned out to be the year of uh, the most original series that were created, 409 original series. So if you uh, binge watched one every day, every day of the year, you would still not be able to keep up with the total number of series. Now there was some stagnation. Super Bowl 2016 was not the highest audience ever, which Super Bowl 2015 was. It was the third highest, but we've had stuff like that before. 
but the number of U.S. TV households did not increase in 2015, and that's not something that we've had before. So that's an interesting development. And then uh, not counting just television, there has been no growth in the percentage of U.S. households online since 2013. It's still 85 percent. That's from Pew Research. And ebook sales are down 10 percent. Now, could we say that those ebook sales are down 10 percent because maybe people aren't reading as much? Well, turns out no. Uh, bookstores are back and with a passion. So if you look at the statistics from the American Booksellers Association, huge growth from 2010 to 2015 in both members and locations. And the people who are making the books, Hachette, uh, Random House, Simon & Schuster, all creating new warehouses because they have so many more books. Amazon um, with a physical bookstore. Uh, and then this was an interesting story that appeared in the New York Times, a combination of um, what seems to be retro, a bookstore, um, but high technology too. It's books printed on demand, so they can print, I think, 350,000 different books. Uh, and when someone selects a book, they come to the register and pay their money and then go have a coffee. And when they're done with their coffee, they come back and pick up their freshly printed book. There are other areas where we seem to go forward into the past this year. Um, as you can see from that headline in the New York Times, there's a vinyl LP frenzy uh, bringing record pressing machines back to life. There are people also making compact cassettes, so those machines are valuable. And the New York Times ran a special section called TV Transformed, but the transformation was kind of doubtful when you read what was in it. Uh, they had six main items. Items one and two basically said that cable was still dominant. Item three said that TV is still watched mostly on TVs. Uh, item four said that the main reason that people go to online viewing is that they missed an episode that otherwise they would have watched. Uh, item five was that smartphones are used a lot for music, games, and video, but not for TV programs. And then item six I have there at the bottom right, uh, the winning medium is radio. And then they said, well, it's not necessarily true for millenniums, millennials, um, but the final sentence of that, you can read it says, nearly a quarter have no use for radio in any given week, which means that in any given week, 75% of millennials are using radio. Here's uh, another view that analog is back from the future at the Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, they introduced a vinyl record turntable, uh, a new film-based Polaroid camera, and a cine camera. So let's take a look at those. Here's that new Polaroid camera, and you can see that the print does come out of the camera. Uh, they're not the only company that's been doing this. Fuji has a version, too, with a... Um, print camera that you can aim and have photographs come out. And then down at the bottom is that Kodak uh, Super 8 camera, brand new Super 8 camera that actually does use motion picture film. Uh, the strange thing about it is you, after you shoot the film, you send it in and they'll uh, give you some sort of digital version of it. What they don't seem to have yet is a projector, so you could actually project the film as film. And how about professionally? Well, uh, Quentin Tarantino made a big deal about how he was shooting the Hateful Eight on 70mm uh, film or 65mm film and showing it on 70mm film um, and uh, in a number of special houses. And then there was Bridge of Spies that used film, the Big Short used film. Now, The Revenant was largely shot digitally, but there was film. We had a big discussion of that at the HPA Tech Retreat. Some people were doubting it, but people from the labs were saying, oh, no, it has film in it. But those are all kind of art films. What if we go to the commercial blockbusters? Well, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, the number one movie, uh, set 65 box office records so far this year as of the tech retreat, and uh, it was shot on film. Uh, Jurassic World, 
the number two movie shot on film, Furious 7, uh, the number five movie or the number four live action movie, Cinderella, the number nine movie or the number seven live action movie, Spectre, the number ten movie or the number eight live action movie, and Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, the number eleven movie or the number nine live action movie. All of them used film. Then we have Rentrack, and they're reporting that in 2015, the worldwide box office, the film box office, had a new record with $38 billion plus. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Now, how about in production technology? Well, here is a page of a notebook from 1877. Uh, it's from a guy by the name of George R. Carey, who was in Boston at the time, and is probably the first person to apply the word camera to an electrical device. And so this might be considered the first video camera, 1877. Uh, it's courtesy of the Carpellis Manuscript Library Museums. And um, the interesting thing about this video camera is it had no scanning and therefore it had no frames. So whenever anything changed in a particular pixel, that's when you saw it. Well, there is a modern version of that too. Um, so here is a recently developed silicon retina camera. Now, as you can see, it's got a spinning disk there and um, if the camera is in normal video camera mode and he spins the disc, you can't see the little black dot on it anymore. It just kind of disappears into grayness. But if we put that into the retinal mode and do the exact same thing, now you can see the dot because each pixel is reporting change. Now this is clearly not entertainment quality, but it's something to consider. This is pretty exciting. And they're not the only company doing it. Um, here is a, another company uh, that's doing much the same kind of thing. Well, if we're going to make cameras that are something like retinas, then how about um, storing stuff on DNA? And it turns out that if you make artificial DNA, then you could take, theoretically, all of the world's digital information in roughly nine liters of DNA solution, which is about the amount of liquid in one case of wine. So for archiving, this is pretty exciting. So even though this may have been a, a bit of a retro year uh, in review, it's an exciting retro year in review that uses some brand new technology.